Hello and welcome to the second part of my Septandi special. If you missed it somehow, Septandi is a call out to all the retro tinkerers to celebrate all the tech around Tandy and Radio Shack computers and produce their videos on YouTube during the whole September. I followed the call and used the time to eventually bring my Tandy 1000 RSX back to life. In the last video I built a PSU for this machine and in this video I will continue the journey. This machine is actually quite clean, but it has some rusty spots here and there, so I'd like to get rid of them, cleaning everything, power it up and see what is on the hard drive. I would like to make a clean software setup for my needs and get this machine working as far as possible. I also made some mistakes and wrong assumptions in my last video, which I would like to correct this time. So let's start. To remove the razor slot for ISA expansion cards, you have to remove this triangle plastic holder first by just sliding it up and back like this. It is not held by any screws, but just clips onto the razor PCB. The floppy drive cage is only held by two screws on the front. I don't know what it is, but the left screw seems to be sealed with something. I could remove it with a pair of tweezers. In the comments to the last video, there was a question about cooling and adding a fan. Well, actually, this system has a fan already, which is hidden right under the floppy drive. The whole system doesn't get very warm, so it seems to be enough to have only this one. Unfortunately, it is glued to the bottom. They seem to save every penny whenever they could. And the same is about speaker. It is also glued to the chassis and has to be removed, since I'd like to wash the whole case with water and soap. The hard drive is held by four screws through the bottom of the case. To be able to take the mainboard out of the case, the standoffs on the I.O. ports must be removed first. The mainboard is held in the case with another 6 screws. The whole thing is held in the case by 12 screws altogether. Unbelievable! I guess less would be sufficient. I'd prefer some screws in the fan and on the speaker instead, but well. And here is the mainboard. Look how small it is, just a bit bigger than my hand. It is highly integrated and very cost-efficient. This represents quite good how tough the market became at the time. Anyway, this is the point where I'd like to correct one wrong assumption I made in the last part. Since the power supply doesn't deliver minus 5 volts, I thought that there is no minus 5 volt support in this computer. However, now where I took a closer look I realized something what was quite uncommon for the PCs in their times. Here is a voltage regulator directly on the mainboard, which converts minus 12 volts to minus 5 volts and provides the needed voltage on the ISA bus as well. As you can see, we have a continuity between this voltage regulator and the pin B7 on the ISA slot. So as opposed to the assumption I made in the last video, we should be able to use ISA expansion slots, which need minus 5 volt rail, like for example Creative Sound Blaster 2.0. To remove the plastic back, you not only have to push the standoffs on the bottom, but also unscrew the slot covers, because the long screws are in the way otherwise. And as you can see, the rust on the back of the case is only on places which were exposed to the air. The metal, which was covered by plastic, is pretty clean. And inside there are some rusty spots as well. I used a hand grinder to remove the rust. Unfortunately, the finest sandpaper which I had was still too rough, so the surface came out not as polished as I'd like it to be. But at least the rust has been gone. I made some holes on the bottom of the case to fix the fan inside. I really don't want to glue it again, because it makes it complicated to clean. And the same for the speaker. Now, time to wash the parts. The mainboard was not very dirty, but on one side, near the ventilation holes, there was a lot of fine dust, which I couldn't remove using just a brush. I did not imagine that the washing of the top part would be a problem. However, it was. The cover is very rough and refused to get clean. The dirt was sitting deep, so I tried all kind of chemicals, lumps and brushes to get it clean again. Unfortunately, the cover had a lot of black circle marks, which are coming from the rubber feet of a monitor, which was standing on the top, I guess. I tried everything, breath, alcohol, baking soda, cleaning petrol and even WD-40, but nothing helped. Eventually, I had to confess my defeat and move on. 
To prevent the chassis from further rusting and to protect the polished surface, I sprayed some clear varnish on it. Now to the PCU, which I didn't fix properly last time. I bought some longer zip ties and this can be now fixed as was planned in the first place. The fan was very dirty, but was running actually quite silent. As I opened it, I found a metal brace holding the bearing inside. I decided not to disassemble it and just to oil and clean it from the outside. The fan was sitting in the case like that, pulling the air into the case and pushing it on the sides out of the ventilation holes. I was not sure if I want to leave it like that or to turn it around. Pulling the air into the case would mean a higher pressure inside and so less dust coming from the ventilation holes. However, this also would mean that the fan would pull the dust and dirt from the outside. What would explain why it was so dirty? So I decided to add a filter between the fan and the bottom hole to keep as much dust as possible outside. I messed up a little bit and made the holes for the fan just a little bit too wide for the normal screws. So I had to take four screws with bigger heads. What is not bad, because they will act as a standoffs and protect the fan hole from being covered. The screws are on the other hand still lower than the case feet, so it will not scratch on the table surface. And the speaker is now also held by two screws. As I wanted to put back the slot covers, I realized something strange. All the metal parts had this white oxidation around the rust. You also could clearly see the fingerprints in these places. I don't know what it was, but I guess that the person which built this tandy have had his hands covered with something. And all the places where he or she touched the metal got oxidized and rusty over the years. Look at the battery. It is not common for a cell battery, but I first thought that it is leaky. However, it came out that it is not, and is still absolutely working. It seems to be the same oxidation as on the other metal parts, and I think the original builder of this PC touched the battery as well as it was inserted. I put some white vinegar on the oxidized metal and see how it reacts. I'm really curious what it was on the fingers to end in this disaster. Let's take a look at the floppy drive. It has no screws and can be opened just by pushing away two hinges on the side. The drive looks quite clean, just a little bit of dust, which can be removed with some pressed air. The heads get a treatment with some alcohol and the mechanical parts get some fresh silicon grease. I guess we are almost done and can power on the machine. The plastic button is needed to get to the power button inside of the case. And we have some errors since the settings were reset due to remove battery. Ok, let's do some settings. The hard drive shall be auto detected. Then we have a 1.44 MB floppy drive. I tried to boot a couple of times, but the machine aborted each time due to memory setting error, until I understood that here you have to be very specific and set the amount of base and extended memory separately by hand. It seems not to be recognized automatically as done in a usual PC. As soon as the memory mystery was solved, the Tandy complained about missing boot devices. Then I took once again a brief look on the main board and realized 
that I forgot to connect the IDE cable. That was really stupid, but fully explains why the hard drive couldn't be found. As soon as the hard drive was connected, the system booted and I finally landed in Microsoft DOS. Or better to say some kind of Czech Norton Commander clone. I can't check really, but I can understand it to some extent, especially when it is written. So I was able to poke around a little bit through this manager M602 and dig around on the hard drive. Unfortunately, there was no Tenti related stuff on this machine at all. It was obviously used as a normal PC somewhere in Czech Republic, I guess. At least I found Checkit pre installed and it confirmed that it was a plain Microsoft DOS 622 on an apparently usual 386 machine with 3 MB of RAM, a VGA graphics card, and 107 MB hard drive. After searching around, I even found some games like this Dyna Blaster and some Czech card games. Furthermore, there were Norton utilities installed, so I fired up Norton Disk Doctor to check the physical state of the hard drive surface. Luckily, it was in perfect condition. Unfortunately, I couldn't find anything interesting else. Some private documents, a lot of English dictionaries and language training programs, but nothing particularly interesting. Maybe one thing left to mention, that there was also Windows 3.1 pre-installed. But also there was nothing really exciting. One thing I wanted to try before I turn off the machine again is that the floppy drive is working. And it did. So, I decided not to back up the old hard drive and move on with a clean installation. However, I didn't want to mess around with floppies and decided to use my GoTech floppy emulator, where I have everything I need for a clean installation. However, this is the part where things got really interesting. I connected the drive and turned on the machine. The drive seemed to be powered properly and I could select the floppy drive, where I have Microsoft DOS installation disk. However, the computer suddenly complained about missing floppy drive. I played around with the BIOS settings, tried different cables and floppy drive. Beside GoTech, I used also NEC, Mitsumi and another Sony drive. I thought at least that one should work, because the original floppy drive in the system was a Sony. However, all of them refused to work completely. The system just didn't recognize them. So I started to suspect that the floppy drive in this machine is not nearly as standard as I thought it to be. I took the floppy drive again out of the case and found the switch on the side. I don't know how I could miss that as I cleaned the drive, but this was the time where I realized that RTFM statement is a point and I really should look into the manual. After some googling I found this 1000s tech notes and jumper manual. I'll put the link below into the description. This manual is for all kind of Tandy 1000 models and it also contains the RSX part. So let's take a look into it. Here we have a summary. Most of it is what we already know. It says that the 3.5 inch floppy drive is actually standard. But let's see what we find in the chapter about the floppy drives. And here we go. See the note? This is not a standard 3.5 inch floppy drive. It has been designed to draw the power through the data cable. Do not try to use a standard 3.5 inch floppy drive as you will short out your system. Oops! Nice that I decided to read the documentation after I tried all of my standard floppy drives in this machine. So I decided to validate this statement and disconnected the power cable from the floppy drive. Fortunately the system didn't find the floppy drive without it. So maybe this revision doesn't send the power through the data cable, so everything is still okay? Let's see what else we can find in the manual before I fry everything to the death. First the power supply. It seems to be very weak indeed, only 25 watts, and it seems to be the same as used in RL, RLX and RLX-B models. 25 watts is nothing compared to 150 watts to 200 watts PSUs you can usually find in comparable PCs. That's why this system has only two ISA expansion slots and I guess this could already be too much. However, our new PSU delivers about 50 watts so it should be actually okay. Another interesting point is that the original hard drive sold with this machine was 52 megabytes. 
I found this information already in multiple places and I strongly believe that the 107 megabyte Seagate, which is currently installed in this machine, is not the original disk. Okay, I got the information I needed. The floppy drive is not standard indeed and DOS has to be installed in a classic way using the floppies. I live in Germany and I have also German keyboard so I have to set it properly even if the DOS is in English. DOS installation went without a problem. Now it was the time to get all the programs, drivers and games onto the machine. My preferable solution for this is a network card. And this is the point where I have to admit a mistake which I made in the last video. As soon as I added the network adapter, the system became heavily unstable. I could boot into DOS and even install network drivers and such things, but then the hard drive sporadically started to spin down. The system obviously didn't get enough power. I took the power supply out of the case and connected four hard drives to get some decent load and, as expected, the power supply failed. All the hard drives remained silent and the 12 volts voltage dropped to 11.4 volts or less. After some investigation I realized that the diode, which I added for security reasons to protect the polarity reversion, was a bad choice. The problem was that I simply took the diode which was used to rectify 115 volts in the original PCU. However, it was probably not a good fit for 12 volts, which I had now. This resulted in an underpowered Pico PCU in the end. As soon as I shorted the diode with a pair of tweezers, all four hard drives started to work stable and the voltage rose to 11.7 volts. Still a bit low, but a lot better. And as soon as I removed the tweezers, the voltage dropped instantly again and the drives turned off. So I replaced the diode. And all the drives work stable again. I left this combination running for about 20 minutes and it didn't show any issues anymore. After putting the power supply back into the case and connecting everything, I could finish the network setup and connect the netbook to transfer everything I needed to the Tandy PC. I used the network card only to transfer all the data I needed for now. I just didn't want to struggle with 100 floppies. After that I removed the network card again. It is going to be a topic in the third part of the series. For now, I wanted to have the system as pure as possible to see if I get any stability issues in original state whatsoever. This is how it looks like so far. As a keyboard and mouse I used these USB bottles which support dual mode with a PS2, so I could connect them using these adapters. And after the hard work, finally! Prince of Persia version 1.3 ran with Tandy Music Digital Sound and VGA out of the box. Sorry about the sound quality, I recorded it through the camera microphone, so it is quite poor. But I promise you line out recordings in the next part. What else? Well, what is a Tandy without Deskmate, right? Welcome to Deskmate. For help at any time, press the key labeled F1. I won't do a review of the Deskmate here, but one thing I'd like to show you. The real-time clock seems to work very reliably. I tested it over two days and it seems to keep up to a second. Also, the 2020 date seems to be alright. However, Deskmate seems to have problems with it and complains about invalid date. Is it something you can confirm as well? Does Deskmate have Y2K problems or something similar? Okay, what else did I install? I added some Tandy RSX specific tools and drivers. Let's take a brief look at it. 
First of all, set up rsx.com. This is mainly the bio setting software for DOS. Here you can do the same settings as what you can do in the main BIOS. Very handy. Setmode.exe is a program where you can switch between all kinds of video modes. Then there is the zacu.exe. This is a utility where you can set up video refresh rates and save the configuration. This is very useful if you want to use a CRT monitor. Once you made your choice, you can put avga to cfg.com into auto exec pod to restore the video refresh rates you configured previously at boot time. And this is actually it. In this video, I cleaned everything, added filter for the fan, revisited the PSU and fixed some mistakes which I made last time, made a clean software installation including Microsoft DOS 622, desk made, some Tendi specific software and some games. I played with the machine now about 5 hours and it is absolutely stable. I already found some good and some bad things about it, but this is a topic for another day. So next time I would like to get into gaming, talk about Tendi sound and make some upgrades to this machine. So far, I hope you enjoyed it and I'd be glad to have you on my channel again when it is about Septended Part 3. Thank you and goodbye.